Hello, everybody. This is Michael Beverly. Uh, welcome to my show, my YouTube channel. And I have a special guest, Mike Lacona, who's about to release a new book. So I invited him here today to talk about his new book. So uh, uh, welcome, Mike. And how about uh, maybe quickly introduce yourself and just uh, let's talk a little bit about this, this what looks to be like a like, you know, an exciting new area of book writing for you. Yeah, well, thanks, Michael, and it's it's good to be with you again. So a little about myself. I, I'm a Christian. I'm a conservative Christian. Um, I teach New Testament and Christian apologetics at Houston Christian University. I'm a professor of New Testament studies there. Um, I went through several periods of intense questioning and doubts earlier in my life. Um, even sometimes now I experience some doubts. Um uh, it's it's usually emotional doubt that that's going on that I've uh, found that it is, but um, I guess I've just come to a point. You know, I'm I'm going to be 63 in a couple of months, and uh, I I just want to know and follow truth and know why I believe certain things, and I'm I'm fine questioning things things that I have believed for a long time. So uh, several years ago, I was having a debate with Bart Ehrman. We had we had uh, two one back in 2000, I think 2008, and another in 2009. Uh, Bart and I have since had we we've had a total of seven debates and have become friends. Mm -hmm. um, but during that those debates, he pressed one of the objections against the Gospels. One of the main objections were the contradictions. The he called them differences. And uh, they, those differences really don't, they, they didn't bother me then, because once you come to the conclusion that Jesus rose from the dead, um, if Jesus rose, I think most of us would agree that Christianity is true. Um, and even if there are some discrepancies or errors in the Gospels, they wouldn't do much to undermine the truth of Christianity, since Jesus would have risen from the dead before any of the Gospels were written. But I did notice that these differences in the Gospels were disturbing to a lot of Christians. And so I launched on an eight-year project. Um, at that point, Richard Burridge, who had been a trained classicist, did a uh, his PhD dissertation on the genre of the Gospels and concluded that the Gospels are ancient biographies. And ancient biographies, um, the biographers weren't as committed to precise reporting as modern biographers are. So what kind of implications might that have for the Gospels and the differences in them? So what I did was I looked at, uh, made a list of all the biographies written about anyone, and those biographies were composed somewhere in the neighborhood of 150 years prior to Jesus to 150 years after. Just kind of an arbitrary dating. I mean, we could expand it a little bit further into the future. They didn't really have them prior to 150 BC, but you could go a little bit further in the future if you want. Um, and there were about 90 um, that were uh, composed within that period of time. Plutarch wrote 48 of those, well, at least 48 that have survived of his more than 60 that he composed. So as I was reading through those 48, I noticed that several of them report the same events because a lot of the figures uh, lived with uh, are at the same time. And in fact, many of them participated in the same events. So for example, Caesar, Cicero, Pompey, Crassus, Antony, uh, Cato the Younger, etc. And so by comparing how Plutarch, the same author using the same sources, and in many of those cases, reporting, composing those biographies at the same time, is he copying and pasting? What do we see here? So I found nine of these um, biographies report the same events two or more times. And there are about 36 stories that Plutarch reports two or more times within those nine biographies. And of those, 30 contain differences. And as you start to look at those differences, you notice uh, certain patterns of these types of differences. And Christopher Pelling, who's the leading Plutarch um, authority in the world has had written on this a uh, single journal article, which he later published in his book, Plutarch in History. Um, Christopher Pelling taught at Oxford. 
And he calls these compositional devices, devices that these ancient authors would use um, in, to paraphrase and to change the stories a little bit. And you can see these going on in Plutarch. And then you have other classicists who will say, yeah, these compositional devices, compression, conflation, displacement, transferal, et cetera, these were universally used in ancient biography and history. So then I'm thinking, well, what if we looked at the Gospels? What if we you know, looked at the differences in the Gospels? Would it account for them? So I read through the Gospels at that point, eight times in Greek, eight or nine times in Greek, and I made a list of all the differences that I saw. And these become a little more apparent in Greek than they are in English. And then I looked at them and said, you know, most, almost all of these can be accounted for by the kind of compositional devices that were part and parcel of using ancient biography. That doesn't mean that all of them would be accounted for in that way, um, but a lot of them would certainly. It, it seems clear that they're using these compositional devices, and that resulted in the differences in the gospel. So the problem with looking at these differences, uh, you know, you have skeptics saying, well, this shows the gospels are unreliable, whereas a lot of conservative Christians will say, uh, we can't acknowledge these if the Bible is divinely inspired. Well, both are wrong, I think. Yeah, um, everybody has a little bit of a problem. It, yeah. Can I ask you a question? Is that is is calling these literary devices technically accurate as well? Or I mean, when you say compositional device, is it fair to say literary device? Is that kind of sure? I it, think so. synonymous. Yes, so, I think it's synonymous. So. I I recently like I recently got interested in this very subject and and just to, just as a as a pitch here, I'm looking forward to your reading your book, and I always recommend that skeptics, atheists, and as well as everybody, Christians and conservatives, and and everybody read other people's perspective. I think that's a healthy way to go about looking at um, all of these issues, and not just to push it up. Like obviously, I know there's some fringe stuff, but but you know, it's, I don't think it's fair, for instance, to criticize, say, Bart Ehrman without actually reading the book. And and I wouldn't right. want to ever criticize your work without actually reading it. So I think it's fair that people read it. And I do recommend that. I plan on reading it. And I'm curious because I got involved in this. I picked up a book by Robin uh, Faith Walsh. It's called Origins, the Origin of Christian Literature. Is is your book along the same? Like, I, I realize you have different perspectives and probably some different conclusions, but is it in the same are you looking at it and coming to some similar conclusions, or is there a lot of difference between that um, that viewpoint? Yes, there's a lot of difference. They're not really related. Uh, okay. R Walsh uh, thinks that the Gospels were put together, they were composed by um, those of the Roman elite. Now, that is not to say that they were wealthy, but they would have been those who were uh, highly literate and that these were just compositions that were kind of just playing around trying to put together these stories and that almost all of the stories in gospel she contends are fictitious accounts of Jesus. Now she believes Jesus existed, I, I think, um, but she would say a lot of, if not most, perhaps all of the stories in the gospels are fictitious or at least contain a lot of fictitious elements in them. So that that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that uh, when you look at how Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, especially Matthew, Mark, and Luke, how they report the same story, um, but with differences, that in most cases, the differences are intentional and result from compositional devices, literary devices. These were taught in the uh, pro gymnasmata, the preliminary exercises of the compositional textbooks, and then there are others that we see these ancient biographers and historians using that were pretty much universal amongst them. Um, and so these, these just re resulted in minor differences um, and the same kind of differences that we see when um, you have multiple people reporting the same event. Now that's not to say normal variations in eyewitness testimony. That is a different thing altogether, but it's like in our community, every normal everyday communications, we do these things. We compress the stories and narrate them as they, as if they occurred over a shorter period of time. Um, we we do these minor variations just in our ordinary communications. But isn't but one of the problems I think that people bring up, you know, on the on the critical side is John seems to have made differences that can't, you know, like they don't account for, like just it's not an eyewitness difference. It's like he's trying to make a point, like. And so a critic would say, look, when you look at 
when you look at, say, the first miracle, and, and I always say the same thing myself. Like when I read Mark, it's like, if Jesus really turned water to wine and that story is real, why wouldn't Mark at least make a note of that? He Mark seems to imply the first miracle is when he cast the demon out in the in the synagogue, right? So so now I, I know the apologist's response to that is, well, because Mark wasn't concerned with that, which, I mean, okay, that's logical and I get it. I mean, it's, it's certainly possible that Mark didn't want to write that down, but it just, it it for me, at least it sort of, it, it, it begs the question, why? Like, why wouldn't Mark write down these important things? And now, so you seem to be saying that you're, you're looking into the biographies is that when, when John's writing these things down, it's, he's got a different take based on his, his motivations and, and his personality of what he wants to highlight. Is that, is that fair? It's not like it's contradictory. It's just different. Yeah. I mean, now John does say that that is the first, the, turning water to wine is the first miracle Jesus performed, I believe. I don't think Mark says that um, healing the leper in a synagogue was the first miracle that Jesus performed. Although uh, I'll admit that the way he narrates it, the reader is going to get that impression, of course. Um, biographers are going to write according to certain objectives they have. Plutarch talks about objectives. The objective of biographers, or they were called Biographies were called lives back then. Um, the objective was to illuminate the character of the main person, the kind of character that they were. Um, and so they're going to narrate those words and deeds of the person that bring out the kind of person that the main character was. And um, so John, um, as a number of specialists with the Johannine literature have noted, um, that John is going, he probably displaced the temple cleansing to the beginning of Jesus' ministry right after the wedding in Cana where he turned water to wine because he wants to frame the entirety of Jesus' ministry as a Passover. It begins and ends as a Passover. Jesus is our Passover lamb. We see Matthew doing something artistic as well in his genealogy. Um, people try to, at times they try to uh, harmonize the, and reconcile the two different genealogies of Jesus, but that's really difficult to do if you're going if you're trying to do it in a precise manner. A lot of scholars acknowledge that Matthew he's arranged his uh, generations as three sets of fourteen, and he even kind of cheats with the third one by repeating Jeconiah, which is the 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 number fourteen in the second set. He makes it number one in his third set. So we can see that Matthew isn't necessarily trying to be precise here. He's omitting a number of generations, but he's doing this, um, this rhetorical device called gematria, uh, where you assign um, numerical values to letters. So the, the, um, the name David has three letters in it in Hebrew, and the numerical value of those is 14. So Matthew is saying three times 14 it's it's symbolic. The the readers of that time, the Jewish readers, would have picked this up. He's doing this in order to say that Jesus is the Son of David, the Messiah. And he changes the location of the Sermon on the Mount. Rather than being on the plain, it's at the top of the mountain. In order, uh, Jesus, instead of receiving God's law as Moses did at the top of the mountain, he's interpreting God's law. So in that sense, he's the new Moses. Um, and Matthew also has this thing where he's coming out of Egypt and he says, out of Egypt, I called my son, you know, because he flees to Egypt in order to avoid Herod. And then two years later about he comes back. And Matthew is saying this to kind of give a symbolic of Jesus coming out of Egypt. He's like the new Moses in that sense. So there's this there's an artistic writing of this. I don't think these stories are are, are fictitious in and of themselves. But Matthew is crafting them in such a way, altering them just a little bit in order to give the symbolism behind there. This is the kind of stuff that you would do in ancient biography, some biographers more than others. From a critic standpoint, and I would say the same myself, considering myself, okay, I'm, I, I'm, I'm being critical of this, this conclusion that you have. It's like, wait a minute, he, the, the writer's trying to, the writer's, the writer's using the Septuagint and pulling stuff out about, say, my son came out of Egypt. Jesus was not in Egypt. Like, 
I, I think that's a stretch, right? Like that Jesus wasn't literally taken to Egypt. I, I don't think that makes sense to me. Are you saying, and I, and, and I know when you, I've listened to some of your debates with Bart where Bart will say, so you're admitting to a contradiction, Mike, and you would go, no, I'm not. And those of us in the audience, to, to be honest, Mike, is we're like shaking our head, like you just said that didn't happen. And Bart's saying it's a contradiction. And you're saying, no, no, it's not a contradiction. So I'm hearing what you're saying is this is why it's not a contradiction. Uh, um, but certainly you understand our perspective, like we, how we, why we see it that way. And, and like, where do you draw the line? I know you probably, this is probably where you get in a little bit of trouble with conservatives. Where do you draw the line? And was Jesus really in Egypt or, you know, did Herod really kill all of these babies? And, or is, are those literary devices and compositional devices that you're saying biographies use these and no one's trying to be deceptive and nobody, nobody's trying to lie about Jesus. Nobody's trying to say anything false. It's just as a literary device, it's making a point. Is that, am I understanding it right? Because I'm still a little bit confused about this. Yeah. Oh, hey, it's not a contradiction, but it didn't really happen position. Y yes and no. So just to be clear, I do think that they fled to Egypt. Okay. And, but what I think is going on here is Matthew is trying to make sense of this. And he is wanting to show that Jesus is a type of new Moses and the son of David. And so he finds this verse in the Old Testament, in the scriptures that says, out of Egypt, I called my son. And so he says, oh, well, let me repurpose this for Jesus. It's kind of like what um, the early, some of the early Christians did, like Paul and the author of Hebrews, they, they'll, they'll take and repurpose certain scriptures in order to make their point. So look, I, I think there's a really, really strong case uh, even that even Bart Ehrman will acknowledge that the disciples truly believed that Jesus had been raised bodily, physically from the dead. And so it's like, all right, well, are there any clear scriptures that would really predict that the Messiah was going to be raised bodily from the dead ahead of the final day of judgment? And so they're searching the scriptures for this, and they find things such as um, uh, Psalm 2.8, I believe it is, where it says, uh, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. And what, what the early uh, apostles did was they said, oh, okay. Um, even though this was a coronation hymn where it, it's like this would be sang and played when you, the Israelites inaugurated, installed a new king um, and saying, today you're my son. You're today, you are my son. Today I've begotten you. God has adopted him as a son. You've got Paul and other early believers who are repurposing this to say, because Jesus rose from the dead, God says, you are my son. Today I have begotten, I've given life to you, to refer to the resurrection. Or in Psalm 16, 8, it says, um, was it 16, 10, it says, uh, you will not allow your Holy One to see decay. Now, that's Psalm is referring to David, whose life is being pursued. And David says, um, hey, he's saying in this context, God is not going to allow me to be killed. But Paul in Acts chapter 13 repurposes that. And he says, look, we saw Jesus rise from the dead. And this is what was in scripture. You are... Um, you will not allow your Holy One to see decay. And Paul says this couldn't have been referring to David because David died, was buried, his body decayed. We know where his grave is. But Jesus died, he was buried, his body did not decay. Instead, God raised him up and were eyewitnesses to this. So you see what they're doing here, they're not inventing ev events to fit the scripture. They are taking events that they believe occurred and then they're trying to, they're searching the scripture to find scriptures that kind of fit it. Um, now, this isn't just, um, this repurposing isn't something that was just unique to Christians. Jews did it, and we find it in um, the Greco-Roman literature as well, where they will take um, verses out of context, let's say, from the Homeric epics, because it reminds them of something in the present time. Does that make sense? Yes, sir. It does make sense. I, I, my, my question though, when, 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 like even what you said about their mining, they're mining the scriptures for things that match. It seems to me they, they, 
they sort of cherry pick, right? So like when you look at Psalm 22 and they say, oh, this, this applies to Jesus. But anything that doesn't apply, they just say, no, that part, that part doesn't, doesn't work, right? And it's kind of the same thing with the book of Daniel. It's like, well, these, these things work. These don't work. So we're going to say the ones that work, work. And the ones that don't work, don't work. To me, it, like it sounds like you're playing a game of chess where you get the, let, you know, the pawns can be rooks whenever you want them to be. Um, yeah, what, yeah. what is the answer to that? Like, like when when they're pulling stuff out of the, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, it, the the Greek writers in of the of the Gospels are pulling from the Septuagint. Is that is that fairly accurate? They're they're and and it, are there places where you yourself will say, hey, this is kind of problematic because they they strip out one line that they can apply to Jesus, but they ignore the verse in context, which if they use that would totally not apply to Jesus. Yes. Yes. I, I agree with that. Um, yeah. I, I, um, I struggle with how they do these things and I, I don't necessarily appear to prophecy uh, re regarding Jesus. I do think some of the messianic prophecies in Isaiah are, they're, they're pretty strong toward Jesus, but a lot of them, like I, I don't go around saying like some, you know, Jesus made over three or the, the Old Testament made over 300 prophecies about the Messiah that Jesus fulfilled. Well, a lot of these prophecies, perhaps most of them that they would refer to are things like out of Egypt, I called my son. And these to me don't seem to be prophecies. They, they seem to be more like um, typologies. Uh, that you could look back in retrospect and say, hmm, well, that's kind of interesting, but it's not necessarily referring to to Jesus who or the Messiah to come in the, in the future. Um, I think the the most difficult one uh, and the most liberty taking comes from um, I believe it's Matthew twenty seven ten, where Judas throws the thirty pieces of silver back into the temple, and Matthew says, well, this is to uh, fulfill what Jeremiah the prophet said, and then he quotes it. Well, if you look for that verse in Jeremiah, you're not going to find it because it's in Zechariah, and um, it's a totally different context. And what Matthew has done is he's taken one word, the one, the word field from Jeremiah, and put it in the Zechariah text and loosely paraphrases it and then gives it a whole new purpose that wasn't present either in Jeremiah or in Zechariah, and then says the scripture was fulfilled. That is a real stretch, mm. um, and so it's it, something that we would not do today for sure. Well, I mean, I think people get in trouble, especially when they're more on the more conservative side, when they start acting as if the Gospels are eyewitness testimony written as if an investigative journalist from the New York Times or the LA Times was writing. And, and they have to fact check with two sources and everything is, you know, everything. And then, you know, you get different, like different words of Jesus on the cross and, and somebody that wants to harmonize that says, oh, well, Jesus said verbatim everything that's in each different gospel. And critics say, now, wait a minute. That, yeah, that's possible, but it doesn't sound likely and it doesn't sound fair to the text or logical. And I think the last time that we talked, I think you... you agreed that, that that was a stretch. And I think I've read some of your like blurbs and stuff that says, no, when people are harmonizing, they're kind of, they're pushing the boundaries here of what makes sense. And so yeah. in, in, your, in your book that's about to come out, uh, what do you think like the most conservative and the, you know, kind of the very, the books are, you know, there's no errors in the Bible and everything is verbatim and perfect. When, when those critics criticize your your work i mean we both understand where they're coming from emotionally and i i get it what is your response to that like is there what would you tell somebody that's a dear christian friend of yours that says mike you're hurting you're hurting the faith you're hurting mm -hmm. christianity um and i know you're one of the reasons i really like you is that you seem well not seem you are you are an honest historian who's really trying to be honest with the text and and when that creates conflict you're not afraid to admit it so what do you say to somebody that that that's, that it feels like it's hurting their faith or they feel like you're maybe damaging the message? Well, first of all, thanks, Michael, for your, your kind word there. Um, uh, look, look, I can sympathize with, with that view 
Um, some people have had their faith rocked as a, a result of this. Um, I can say that by far, I've received more, far more comments about people who have been encouraged by this and that it's actually saved their faith because they didn't feel like they had to be locked into a very wooden view of inerrancy, um, which goes against what they observe in scripture. So I operate by two principles when I'm doing my work. Number one, our view of scripture needs to be consistent with what we observe in scripture. Um, and, you know, this stuff like with gospel differences and that some of the authors intentionally changed some of the things, um, it didn't take God by surprise. All right. So it's not like he's blushing because he was found out or it's like, oh, I didn't know that. I'm glad Lacona pointed that out or, boy, I wish he hadn't found that. I was trying to hide it all these. No, he knew before scripture was even composed that this stuff would happen because the writers are writing according to the literary conventions in play in the first century, the writers of the gospels, that is. Um, they, they weren't trying to guess what the literary conventions for writing biography in the 21st century was going to be and then tried to figure that out and then write according to what we'd be looking for at the expense of what the ancients in their own day would be looking for. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John did not form a committee for the misleading of future historians and readers. They were writing according to how they were taught to write. And it is us, when we are reading the Gospels through the lens of 21st century and our own literary conventions that we struggle, that you know, that causes the struggle. It's not their fault. It's our fault. The second um, principle I operate by is that if we truly want to have a high view of Scripture, then we must accept it as God has given it to us instead of trying to force it to fit a mold of how we think he should have. And if we re neglect in doing this, then we may think we have a high view of Scripture, but in reality, we only have a high view of our view of scripture. And that's not good. I know that's, that's a very good point. And I've heard other scholars who, who would be on the opposite side of you, but also have a high view of scripture. I'm thinking of Dennis McDonald, who we talked a little bit about last time, who loves the Bible and loves the scriptures. And, and I've heard him say, he says, look, if you're trying to harmonize this, you're destroying the beauty of it. And you're, and you're introducing a problem that shouldn't exist because you, you can't harmonize. It's impossible. Mm -hmm. But if you look at it as the way it was meant to be written. So you and I, you and I slightly mentioned a little bit last time we talked about. Now, hold on. Look, can I just respond sure. to one thing you said? Oh, oh sure. Um, you said Dennis McDonald has a high view of scripture. Um, I guess we should define what I mean by that. A, a high view of scripture would mean it, it is originating from God. Yeah, and okay. It, yes, and that, is I, authoritative in our lives, yes. whereas Dennis wouldn't acknowledge it either. No, yeah, I stand corrected. You're right. His high view of scripture as a, is as a literary hmm. composition. Uh, that you're, thank you for correcting me on that. That, that. I've noticed that a lot of Bible scholars that went into scholarship as Christians, um, Dennis McDonald and, and, and others, well, obviously Bart Ehrman, um, came out the other side you know whether not necessarily atheists but skeptics although dennis mcdonald is is an atheist um mm -hmm. they still love the bible and they still love it but you're but you're right so i i just definitely want to be clear i i do understand what you're saying there is a big difference between a high view of scripture as it's god's word to us and a manual for living your life and, and etc as opposed to looking at at like it's oh it's like homer or euripides it's br brilliant and it survived the ages because because of its brilliance. So, um, so real quickly here, you said Robin, Faith, Walsh, you guys are in like in different spectrums. Do you see some of Dennis McDonald's uh, where he's where he's finding similar similarities with Homer or Virgil or Euripides as somewhat aligning with what you're seeing? Because I heard you say the way they were trained as writers. I'm assuming they're trained in in Greek, right? And I'm assuming they're you're you're acknowledging they're familiar with. Homer. I mean, that seems like axiomatic or no? Um, I mean, yes and no. And and when we say about they in terms of uh, the authors of the Gospels, uh, personally, I think that the traditional authorship is correct for all four of them, although I'm open to, certainly open to 
something different, especially for the Gospel of John. Um, I do think that when it comes to Matthew, Mark, and John, that those three almost certainly used an amanuensis, a secretary. And that would have been commonplace anyway. Cicero used one named Tiro. Uh, you have Paul, he used probably several different ones. One in particular, Tertius identifies himself in Romans 16, 22, which is the crown jewel of all of Paul's letters and is written with far more literary beauty than any other of his letters. So uh, Tertius probably did a whole lot more in Romans than just Dick take dictation. I suppose maybe some of the others did that as well. So I think Matthew, Mark, and John at minimal had a secretary who would, you know, they took notes and then composed these things. And then Matthew, Mark, John would have approved of the final product uh, before it was circulated. Um, I, I've heard the same of Marcus Aurelius's meditations. Is, is that kind of the same thing where people will say, there's some of the some of the meditations are probably redacted, edited by people that you know compiled it or, di or, or took di dictation, but didn't change the spirit or the nature of what Marcus Aurelius. And I think the same thing could be said with um, with Julius Caesar's the war campaign writings would would also it's not he probably had somebody writing it. Is is that kind of what you're saying? It's sort of along the same lines as that. Those are interesting um, examples. Um... I just haven't studied that well enough to be able to address that. I, I wouldn't surprise me. It would seem plausible for that, but I can't really answer okay. that. It, it, fair enough. What about people that say, no, no. Uh, so I've heard this said, not, not specifically about you, but just in general, those Christian scholars who are trying to, are tr who are trying, who are saying, Hey, this is not, this is not eyewitness testimony and you don't have to struggle so hard to harmonize. You're the tail wagging the dog. You're 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 hurting your brain for no reason. These are eyewitness testimony. These are eyewitness tests. I know I've analyzed it. It's eyewitness. Would you say no? That's not scholarship is against that. Whether it's Christian or skeptic, or or it, what would you how, you know? How do you respond to this idea of, of the pushback? No, no. You, you, <laughs> these are eyewitness testimonies, a hundred percent. Um. Yeah, I'll answer that. I, I want to go back just for a moment because I don't think I answered your previous statement um, jo, jo, about influence of other writings like Homer. Uh, Josephus, it, it's widely acknowledged that he has some Homeric flavoring in the way he does his history of the Jews. That is not to say that what Josephus writes is inaccurate. It is um, about certain things where there's Homeric flavoring. It's just to say that he has arranged it in a certain way that readers could say, ah, you know, this is kind of similar to, to Homer here. And it's possible, I would think, that Mark did something similar and that there is some Homeric flavoring there, but that doesn't mean the stories were invented. Let me just give uh, uh, one kind of example, uh, not necessarily in Mark, but it's in Caesar's commentary uh, on the Civil War, the Spanish War with Pompey. And in there, he tells of um, an, a, a time when his army was faced off against Pompey's, and there's a like a um, a plane in between them um, where a battle would take place, and they're they're kind of faced off. And then a guy named Antistius Turpio, who was a warrior on Pompey's side, comes out on the battlefield alone, and he's taunting Caesar's army, saying there wasn't a man among them who was a match for him. And then Caesar says, from his side came a Roman knight named um, Pompeius Niger. And the two met on the battlefield, and Caesar says they were evenly matched, and it reminded him of the encounter between Achilles and Memnon. So that's kind of interesting um, that, you know, he's referring back to this encounter uh, in the Homeric epics that he saw some similarities between that and this actual historical event. So it's kind of like some Homeric flavoring in there. And look, when you're, I could cite examples also in Suetonius and Cicero and, and others where they acknowledge or they see similarities between historical events and fictitious events in the past. All right. So 
they're acknowledging these things. So of course you could see some flavoring. Someone could even construct the story in such a way that this flavoring is brought out even more so. Um, so, okay. So that's what I wanted to say there. That That's not necessarily to say, I, I just, I disagree with Dennis that Mark uh, especially is copying. He's inventing stories to compete with the Homeric epics. I don't think that is going on there. And um, Dennis and I had talked about a future debate that we'll do to discuss this very thing. And I look forward to that. Now, in terms of the eyewitness testimony, I do think that the eyewitness testimony of Peter is behind Mark. I do think that... Um, John is either written by an eyewitness through a secretary um, or that it's closely rooted in eyewitness testimony. In fact, the majority of critical scholars today think that either John was written by a minor disciple of Jesus who had traveled with him, who not one of the 12, though. Um, so that would either be eyewitness testimony or that the author, whoever he was, used one of Jesus' disciples, this either minor disciple or John, the son of Zebedee, as his primary source or one of his primary sources for the gospel. So that would mean it's closely rooted in eyewitness testimony. The majority. Uh, so what about, though, when when there's there's sections in in the gospels that mirror stuff that happens in the Septuagint, sometimes word for word, like with Elisha's miracles, the the widow, the raising of the dead? when the stories are written in such a way that the wording is, I mean, it's in some places it's copy and paste. Doesn't that seem to indicate the, the, the writer wants to get across this point. Jesus raised the widow's son or raised the, the centurion's son, a daughter, Jairus's, Jairus's daughter. When, when that account seems to mirror the Septuagint, doesn't that seem to imply that he's doing the thing that you're saying that biographers do, where it's like, hey, Jesus was really raising dead people, but to make the point, I'm going to pick this thing that's a literary, and it's recognized certainly by Hellenistic Jews reading this, they would know it came from the Septuagint, no? Um, I don't see any kind of copying, like let's say with the... Um... The raising of Jairus's daughter from the dead. Um, you might make a case for the widow's son, but I mean, they were in a funeral already, a funeral procession, which is different than what we find Elijah doing. Um, the, in Elijah, the, the boy was in his bed, dead, uh, in his house. Um, I think at most, you, you might have something like the author's um, might want to do some flavoring from the Old Testament that it's, oh, you know what? We had Elijah and Elisha in the Old Testament raise people from the dead. Yes, Jesus, he's a great prophet, and he's raising people from the dead too. Mm -hmm. But that wouldn't mean that the gospel authors invented those things. They might have some flavoring behind it. Okay, well, what about when, when Matthew and Luke, in that case, I mean, I don't want to say, I don't want to say you're saying, or I'm saying it's cut and paste, but isn't it true that in Matthew and Luke, there's a lot of sections that are that are almost verbatim or very close to verbatim from Matt from Mark? Is that that's correct? Yes, um, that that is okay. correct. And when we see these, what's really interesting when it's virtually verbatim. I mean, sometimes thirty or more words are verbatim in a row. So um, in cases like that, it would seem that you know they're using a common source, of course. And and I'm one of those who. The, the strong majority that think that Matthew and Luke use Mark as their primary source and supplement it. So in those cases, when they're using Mark and then you see some minor differences between them, then you look at the kind of differences they are and you say, whoa, these are the very kinds of differences that would result from the exercises, those pro gymnasmata in the compositional textbooks. And so it's just them using the rhetoric and the kind of things to paraphrase and elaborate that we find that these ancient authors were actually taught and instructed to do. Yeah. Okay. Well, that may, that actually makes really good sense to me. So when when a Christian apologist says, "No, Mike, you're just wrong. This is eyewitness testimony, and eyewitness testimonies disagree." And I've heard it said, "If you find eyewitness testimony in total agreement, then that." then that means they conclude they colluded and that we we can't never put that in court. 
So like, I, I think people want to make the implication that we could actually put, you know, Mark, Matthew, Luke, and John on a witness stand in a, in a modern American courtroom and that they could testify what they wrote down as, as if the original writing was, you know, done in a, you know, in a deposition and that, and that they, and then they could testify, yes, this is exactly what happened. And what would you say to that? I mean, I, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but it seems to me like you're saying, no, this is, this is not eyewitness testimony in that way, in that sense. Is that correct? I, I think that there are some cases in the gospels where that can be said, um, that it's the normal variation in eyewitness testimony. One example, I think a clear example, that would be, um, the four accounts in the gospels of Jesus before Pilate. And, um, these, have differences that I, I think would reflect uh, different sources being used here, and that could be eyewitness testimony. But most of the cases where you have these differences, it's where you have Mark in priority and Matthew and Luke are using Mark as their source, and then it's varied. So just to give you uh, uh, what I think would be a very clear example is in the um, Olivet Discourse. Now that discourse occurs in the final week of Jesus' life, Jesus has overturned the tables in the temple. He's cleansed the temple. And then later on, as they're leaving Jerusalem, his disciples say to him, Lord, look at what beautiful buildings are here in the temple complex. And that's when Jesus predicts that not a stone are going to be uh, will be left on top of another. The day is coming of its destruction. And then later on, the disciples say to him, um, when are these things going to be? What are the signs of it? And then that's the Olivet Discourse, when he's talking about the destruction of the temple and all these things that are about to happen. Well, Mark, at, at one point, Jesus says, um, when you see the army surrounding Jerusalem, um, and uh, I'm trying to think exactly what it says, but you know the abomination stand, of desolation standing where he shouldn't be, something like that. And then a parenthetical statement, let the reader understand, let those who are in uh, Jerusalem flee to the mountains. Okay. Now that's kind of interesting. What does it mean? Let the reader understand. Well, we'll get back to that in a second. When Matthew reports the same thing, his is a little more, he elaborates a little bit. He adds uh, some more details there. Uh, like da Daniel, what Daniel said, um, but that parenthetical statement, let the reader understand is found in the exact same spot. So it's an awkward position. Um, it'd be like me as a professor saying, all right, now, um, on Thursday, we're, we're going to have a quiz. So study this chapters 13 and 14, uh, because Thursday we're going to have a quiz. And then later on, they're telling, um, someone else who missed the class that they're going to have a um a quiz over chapters 13 and 14 they wouldn't have that parenthetical statement that's going to be right in the middle of those instructions like i just gave it um but matthew puts it there in the same awkward position that mark puts it and so that means that either Matthew is using Mark or they're both using a common written source. Either way, it's a written source because let the reader understand, right? So it is a document and it's in the same spot. So certainly Matthew, if we go with Mark and priority, Matthew is almost certainly using Mark there. And then the differences, the additional details are things that Matthew adds to that. And that is a uh, one of the compositional devices of the pro gymnasmata called addition that Theon mentions. Okay. Uh, is the consensus, is the consensus solid on the dating? I, I like, I know you said your position is the traditional authorship. And of course, mm -hmm. the, I mean, that's controversial, especially oh, in the skeptic community. Sure. Um, in, in the, in the, the way I hear, obviously most, on the skeptical side is like, you know, Mark's writing sometime between 70 and 80. And then, and then the more conservative is no, absolutely not. He was writing in 40 or 50. Do you have a feeling of like, like where you, where you fit and how that lands in terms of, you know, the general majority view in terms of 
conservative to the spectrum of more, you know, less conservative? Um, you know, I'm happy to go with, I, I haven't done in-depth studies of the, um, the authorship and the dating. Um, I mean, I have done some studies and I do have some opinions, some educated opinions you could say on that, but I'm not uh, dogmatic on these. What I can say is that I had a student named Josh Pelletier and um, I supervised his master's thesis. He surveyed more than 200 critical New Testament scholars writing in English since 1965. Now I think his, his his, I think he finished in 2019. Okay. So it's been about five years. He's gone on to do his, he's doing his PhD research now and expanding that and also including French and German scholarship in there as well. But what he found, he, he looked at three things. One was Mark written. Who wrote Mark? Was it the traditional authorship or a man named Mark? And who was Mark's primary source? Now, he cataloged these. Now, not you'd have some scholars that would say they would do say something about the dating, but they wouldn't say anything about the authorship or Mark sources. You would have some say, um, yeah, it was written by Mark, but we don't know of his source. Um, or yes, uh, the traditional authorship is correct, and um, Mark's primary source was the Apostle Peter, but they don't talk about the dating of Mark. So and then some scholars, a number of them of those 200 would say, this is what the majority position is, but they wouldn't talk about their own. So that makes it a little more difficult to bean count. But what Josh found was of those who commented, of the 200 that commented on those particular things, the majority of critical scholars think that Mark wrote between 65 and 70, the years 80, 65 to 70. Um, and if you were to expand that to include more scholars, it actually goes earlier in time. You could say 50 to 70. And he found that only about 10% of those who talk about, who actually give their own opinion on the dating, their own opinion on the dating, only about 10% of them think that Mark was written after the year 70. So that's that's kind of interesting. The majority of critical scholars who comment on the authorship agree with the traditional authorship and the majority of critical New Testament scholars who talk about Mark's source think that Mark's primary source was Peter. Now, in all three cases, it's a minority, a small, I'm sorry, a, I'm wrong there. In all those cases, it's a small majority, but it is still a majority nonetheless. Well, is it fair to say that people that go into New Testament studies tend to fall towards Christians? I mean, that and that seems logical to me. And that if you weighed, if you weighed this study, and this is one of my problems with, with, uh, with Gary Habermas's claims is, okay, can you release the study and give us a spreadsheet? Because if you have, let's say, let's say eighty percent of those scholars are, are very, you came from a very fundamentalist or a very conservative background. I, th I think it would be fair to say, well, you, yeah, okay, but your your numbers are a little skewed because. You know, if I if, if I pull if I pull in the in a Republican district, who should be president? They're going to say, well, Trump, obviously, like like and then I could pull in a liberal district and they would say, well, no, it should tr Trump's terrible. So people's opinions are obviously influenced by their. You know, their their bias going into it. I don't know of any I, I, I've wondered about this. Maybe you could enlighten me a little bit. Is there any is there any way to weigh a study. In other words, let's say we have 10% of our scholars are, are secular and 50% are conservative Christians and say 50% or 40% are more liberal Christians. And then we sort of weigh it because if you have a million conservatives in your poll, you could say 99.99999% of scholars agree in this, but that's not really a fair, that's not a fair polling way to go about. And they, like it doesn't work statistically. Yeah, it is. It does get a little difficult to quantify. What I can say is that anyone who attends the annual meeting of the Society of Biblical Literature will know, um, if you hang around the, the, the attendees, and there are thousands, um, and you see the, the various breakout sessions and sections that are there, you'll know that the majority of New Testament scholars today aren't necessarily Christians. Now, 
They might be like a Dennis McDonald or John Dominic Crossan who identify as Christians, um, but they don't really believe as a Christian does. I mean, John Dominic Crossan says he doesn't believe there's any kind of a supreme personal being responsible for the creation of the universe or life itself, doesn't believe that there's going to be an afterlife. Same thing with Dennis McDonald. So, but they call themselves Christians because they like the teachings of Jesus. Um, yeah, just as a correction here, I've heard Dennis McDonald say he's an atheist. Like, yeah, I mean, yeah, I have too. I mean, yeah. um, um, he said he's an atheist, but he also has said he's a Christian. Yeah, um, like, a, mean, like we, in, in, the, in the sense of a cultural exactly. identifying. I yeah, mean, okay. I asked him over uh, uh, lunch. It was either the day after our debate or the day of our debate uh, two and a half years ago. And and um, he, he referred to himself as a Christian. And I said, well, how can you say that when you don't believe God exists? He says, well, I, I live in a neighborhood with a lot of Christians, and I just love being around them. And so I call myself a Christian because I, I want to have community with them. Um, yeah. so, um, I mean, you can decide for yourself whether you think that's deceptive. Um, I, I, I'm not going to say one way or the other, but, um, I don't think it, let's say, I don't think it's a Christian in any sense that the apostles would have recognized. Yeah, agreed. And I think, I think most skeptics would say he's, he, what he's trying to say is he's, he's identifying with Christianity as a cultural phenomenon, especially in America. I have talked to people in my past where, where they'll say, of course, I'm a Christian. I'm an American. And I'm like, dude, you don't yeah. believe in, you don't, this is back when I was a Christian. I'm like, dude, you don't believe Jesus rose from the dead or the Bible. You never go to church and you, you like you, there's nothing about your life that, that, that fits in the mold. So, um, yeah, I told, I, I, uh, I totally hear your point. So, so um, I would say in, in agreement with you, yeah, you're going to have Christians. I mean, authentic Christians who are new Testament scholars, they are going to probably lean toward earlier dating whereas skeptics are going to lean toward later dating. Um, I, would, I, would, I would guess moderates, though, you know, they are going to side more with the earlier dating. And when I say that, Mark 65 to 70, um, you're probably not going to have moderates or, or skeptics uh, put Matthew and Luke where some conservatives want to be, mm -hmm. uh, want them to be. But... Uh, the majority of critics today, um, I, I supervised uh, of math, Matt Hill, another student. He did a, a master's thesis, pretty much the same thing, but he did it on Luke Acts. And he found by far the majority, a, a pretty large majority of critical scholars date Luke and Acts between 70 and 100. And not many at all are, are putting it after 100. I mean, you've got Dennis McDonald and Robin Lane. Uh, Robin Faith Walsh putting them. I mean, they go with these these wild late dating, but not many people at all would put them uh, any of the Gospels or well, Acts in the second century. Isn't the real controversy whether it's post or pre seventy A.D. or C.E. depending on your perspective? I mean, to me, that seems like that's the benchmark. If you say it's written on from seventy and a month, or you know, after the after the fall of Jerusalem. I don't care whether it's 71 or 101, it puts it after the fall. It, it doesn't that seem to be like that's the that's actually the art of the debate. Not necessarily. Um, you've got Craig Keener um, and Ben Witherington, both of whom are evangelical critical New Testament scholars, and they place Luke and Acts in the 70s. So um, um yeah. It's not necessarily the case that 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 uh, what well, destruction of the temple and in, in Jerusalem. Well, sure, but what, uh, the the crit the critic looking at it, they want it. I mean, there's a lot of reasons. It's not just because of the fall, but they they would say, "Hey, this is written after 70, and we know that this that Jesus predicting the temple falling is is composition and literary device added retroactively." And I think the reason a lot of conservatives really push back for early dating is. They they want to firmly establish that Jesus predicted his death and the fall of the temple as as a prophetic thing, and once you move past seventy, then it then you can't say that anymore. It's kind of that's sort of the battleground in, in the way I understand it. Um, I think I think you can still say it. I mean, Keener and Witherington would both say that that Jesus predicted the fall of Jerusalem, and and they're writing afterward. The 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 thing that's of interest, and I think it is a decent argument that those who 
replaced Luke and Acts before 70. Um, Luke does have Jesus predicting the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem. And then in the book of Acts, there's no mention of it. It ends with Paul in prison um, somewhere around the year 62. Um, so that'd be before the temple. So you would think that if the temple had been destroyed by that time, that Luke would have mentioned it. I, I think that's a decent, a fairly persuasive argument for replacing uh, the book of Acts prior to 70. The only thing is that Luke doesn't mention anything after the year 62. Um, and it could be that, as Witherington says, he's just trying to give us a history of the church, um, the Holy Spirit's work toward the, the church growing outward and spreading throughout the world in the first three decades after Jesus' death. So that's a possibility. Honestly, I'm kind of persuaded by the argument that, that would say that you give Luke Acts a, a dating of composition prior to the year 70. Uh, I think that's pretty persuasive. But I'm not dogmatic about it because I look and I see even some of my evangelical colleagues who are specialists in Luke Acts placing it 70 or even later. Mm -hmm. It just doesn't okay. really bother me. It doesn't discredit uh, Jesus' prediction about the temple. In fact, uh, I'm not taking any kind of supernatural power away from Jesus or trying to downplay it, but it didn't wouldn't take a prophet to predict the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem. You could see the tensions uh, that would have been um, building up and that the Romans wouldn't have tolerated these things. Yeah, well, maybe somebody would say that the part about no stone unturned unturned that that specific specificity of it like because you can raise a building but that's different from every single stone now mm -hmm. yeah so you mentioned acts uh, real quickly do you do you find the idea that acts models after a travel log or homer ethics on a boat and and you know paul gets rescued from a prison and peter gets rescued from prison and a lot of these sound, sound at least to critics, as, as literary devices taken from, even from Greek written romance. Do you find that completely unbelievable, or are you willing to give some, in the same vein that you're looking at the Gospels as having some literary composition, are you, could you look at Acts in the same way that these are somewhat, because I heard people say, well, Luke's obviously true because he included real places. Well, mm -hmm. Robert Lud Ludlum in The Born Identity included real places, and Tom Clancy includes yeah. nomenclature of weapons to a great specificity. That doesn't make, you know, that doesn't make, you know, the Patriot Games or, you know, any of Tom Clancy's wonderful books, The Hunt for Red October, doesn't make those true, even though his research is amazing. Uh, what, what do you say on that in terms of the applying the same idea to, to Acts? Well, I think you can find parallel details in just about anything. So uh, many of us in the United States are aware of a plane that took off just after uh, early in the morning from Massachusetts. And shortly after 9 a.m., it flew into one of the tallest skyscrapers in the world in New York City between the 78th and 80th floors, killing everyone on board. Um, I'm referring to the B-25 that took off and, and uh, crashed into the uh, Empire State Building on July 28th, 1945. That actually happened. Um, you can see photographs of the aftermath by just doing a, a quick search online. So it's interesting, they took off, the plane took off from the same state, Massachusetts. It flew into a skyscraper in the same city, New York City, during the same hour of the day and even the same floors. But all those things are merely coincidence. They're coincidental. Um, you could look at the same thing with um, a, a ship that um, was sailing across the Atlantic. It was regarded as, as about 100 years ago, it was regarded as unsinkable. It was going a little too fast. It hit an iceberg and the unthinkable happened. It sank and more than half of its passengers perished due to a lack of lifeboats. Now, the name of that boat starts with a T, uh, the Thai, the Thai Tan. Uh, it's the wreck of the Titan and mm -hmm. in a novel yeah. called Futility dated 1898, 14 years yeah. before the sinking of the Titanic. So those things amazing in terms of the similarities, amazing, sure. even down to the name. Mm 
but it's entirely coincidental. So what you have to do is you have to show that there is a causal connection between them in order to show copying. Now, Dennis McDonald will say, well, there's just too many of these. But when you look at what he has to do in order to get these parallels, it's pretty weak. He stretches details. He has to borrow details from two or more stories and combine them together in order to get um, a single uh, parallel. Um, and uh, again, a lot of these are really, really stretched to the, the point of being ridiculous, in my opinion. And that's yeah, why no, I, uh, I Dennis heard. has been able to convince very, very few scholars for, for yeah, him. Yeah, I've heard critical scholars, you know, even, you know, non-Christians say, yeah, he's stretching it. What, the way I look at it, though, however, is there's like clues there. But let me flip the script just a little bit on you here. Tom Clancy's Dead of Honor. So this was written in 1994 as has a, a plane, a, a pilot fly his plane into the Capitol, which leads to, the, you know, the Harrison Ford played character becoming the president in the next book. Um, so. So couldn't we sit, flip the script and say, hey, look, these things that, that Christians like to say, well, hey, look, this is a prophecy. Well, no, I mean, Tom Clancy wasn't prophesying planes flying into buildings. It's just these things, you know, these things happen. Um, by the same token with what you just said about the Titanic thing, it's not, not prophetic. It's just you write enough stuff down in fiction, some of it's going to come true. And when you're when we all admit that they mind the Septuagint, like if critics and and, and evangelicals and, and conservatives, they know what they did. They, they mine the Septuagint for things looking for. So it's real easy to say, can't we say the same thing that they just, they found the stuff that worked and then they put it in there and said, hey, this, this proves it. I think, you, uh, Michael, if you could find, you know, if there were a lot of these stories uh, didn't have to stretch what was written in the Septuagint, in order to to get the match well you might have a better case for that but the it seems to me that because they do have to repurpose those texts the old testament text to try to draw out of them a prophecy for what was to come it seems more likely to me more plausible that these events happen and then they're going back to scripture the old testament to try to make sense of it of something that actually happened um, that just seems to make more sense to me than I, I think if they were inventing a story based on something in the Old Testament, we would have found a, a lot closer match. There would not have been much at all of a stretch. They could have done that instead. Okay, well, fair enough. And that ties back into the whole, the whole, the whole, the, these are, these are witnesses. So some, you, a lot of times you hear people say, well, because there's these apparent problems that makes it more believable. Now, I don't personally buy on to that, but fine. If, if for those that believe these are like real verbatim eyewitness statements or literal, like everything's literal, is there a methodology? So for instance, one of the things that, that I've been reading about lately is this idea of analyzing the witness, analyzing the gospels as if they're witness statements with, with, a, with a technique called forensic statement analysis. Have you heard of this term? And is there valid scholarship on analyzing the Gospels as if they're actual, you know, like if I, if, if the police showed up at your house right now and said, hey, there's a crime, I need you to write down what, what you did yesterday. Mm -hmm. And you write it down and now they're going to analyze whether you're being deceptive or not. Is that, is that, A, my first question is, does anyone do that in, in scholarship? Like is accredited universities teaching this? And does it make sense, that to me, it doesn't make any sense. I'm wondering if, I admit, because I've been searching for some research. I've, in fact, I, I emailed some professors at, at several Bible colleges, and I said, do you guys teach this or do you know about it? And the only answer I ever got was, I have no idea what you're talking about. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm not aware of New Testament scholars using it. It doesn't mean that it's not legit. I'm, and I'm not familiar with it because, uh, you know, I'm not a detective. I haven't been involved in those kind of things. I can say that... Uh, in the previous course that I taught at Houston Christian University, um, and he's in a current course that I'm teaching right now, he has worked for the police department. He's an investigator. He's been an investigator for, I think he said 30 years. And he said, in his experience has been unanimous that when you do have 
actual eyewitnesses to, um, you know, either a crime or an event, um, and he brings them in and he separates them, they're going to tell the story differently. There are going to be discrepancies in minor details, although they may get the gist or, you know, the, um, the, the essence, the essential elements of the story correct. There's, they're not going to be like word for word. And when they are, you know, you can be certain that they're, they are colluding with one another in that sense. So um, I don't know how the forensic thing that you're talking about works, but, uh, and I, I don't know of New Testament scholars doing them. And the reason being is because we recognize with the synoptic problem um, that Matthew and Luke are very likely using Mark as their primary source and supplementing it. So I, I think that that's why you're going to find the differences. Now, I do think so, that Mark is rooted in eyewitness testimony. I do think that Luke and Matthew, but especially Luke, would be rooted in eyewitness testimony. Um, so I'm not doubting that there's eyewitness testimony involved in those. Um, what I'm just saying is when you do find the discrepancies um, in the Gospels, on most of those occasions, I think those discrepancies are the result of the compositional devices being used um, or variations in oral oral tradition. Um, Kenneth Bailey and others have done a lot of work on this, and there's a number of different models. Um, and they see that oral tradition, you could vary, you are allowed to vary some of the details, but only the peripheral, the minor details. And that's why, yeah. you know, with, with the Gospels, you don't find any real significant change um, discrepancies. Maybe the most would be uh, in the infancy narratives. What happened to Jesus shortly after he was born? Did he, was he uh, dedicated in the temple 40 days later and then they settle in Nazareth? Or does he go into Egypt, flee to Egypt for a couple of years? I mean, I think that's probably the most difficult one. But if that's, you know, that and maybe the, the fate of Judas, the two most difficult ones in the entire New Testament, I mean, that doesn't change a whole lot. Yeah, no, but it seems like it seems like that argument wants to have its cake and eat it, too, because it, it's saying eyewitness testimonies disagree or have small detail changes. That's expected. You know, you bring in two witnesses, you separate them. Their stories are slightly different. But at the same time, you're, I also hear these people saying, if you notice that their testimony is exactly identical, then that means they colluded. And we're all agreeing here that, that Matthew and Luke borrow sometimes verbatim, right? So that's right. If we're, if, if we're admitting that Matthew and Luke use Mark often verbatim, doesn't that automatically exclude them as valid eyewitnesses? Even if they were, like even if the, if the extra details could come from a real eyewitness, fine. That, that could be the case, but they're excluded as I would, like you can't have it both ways. If you're gonna admit that identical testimony equals collusion, and we, and that it seems to me axiomatic that they did that, they, at least some of their verses are verbatim. So doesn't that exclude them from being a separate eyewitness source? I don't see how you could argue both things. Well, let, let's just, uh, all right, so Mark and Luke don't claim to be eyewitnesses, right? So if the traditional authorship of Mark is correct, then he's getting his information from an eyewitness. So it's closely rooted in eyewitness testimony. And let's say the traditional authorship of Luke is correct. Um, Luke doesn't claim to be an eyewitness, but he claimed to get his information from eyewitnesses and those who knew the eyewitnesses. So um, Luke, I think, was using Mark, plus he was supplementing Mark because he had been a traveling companion of Paul. So he would have been with some of those things. Plus, he would have rubbed shoulders with some of the other eyewitnesses. So it was common in antiquity, according to Christopher Pelling, again, the leading Plutarch scholar in the world. Um, he said that it was common in antiquity that you would have an ancient biographer or historian rely on a single source for the majority of their information and then supplement it but those other sources weren't responsible for more than 25% of, of it. So they were largely dependent on a single source for maybe 75% or more of what they're reporting. And then the other, you know, 25% or less would be 
based on other things from I from eyewitness sources or other sources that they deemed credible. Um, I think John may be different. He may he's probably familiar with Mark, maybe some of the other gospels, but he still most scholars would agree that he's entirely independent of Mark. So he's writing from stuff that he knows about, and it's more of the vantage point of that beloved disciple, the, the major source behind John's gospel. Does, it, does that make sense? Yes, sir. That does make sense. I mean, obviously we're going to have some different, have some different conclusions, but it, it certainly makes sense. I, I, I tend to look at, I mean, I, I'm going to be honest here. I look at, you know, I, I understand the problems with Dennis McDonald's work and I, and I get this from, from critics and atheists. So I'm, I'm not saying there's not a big problem here, but, when he talks about how it's borrowing from say Dionysus and I like, I see it. I don't want to say it's a parallel. I just see it as the, the way, like I've written some novels. And when I, I, I had a ghostwriting contract a couple of years ago to write some mystery thrillers for an existing line for a, for a public, for an author, he needed help on something. So what did I have to do? I had to read his work. I had to submit an outline to him that, that my, my ghostwritten book is going to follow a certain pattern genre expectations, obligatory scenes, you know, a murder mystery has to have a body, et cetera, et cetera. So like, I get how this is done. So when I, when I listen to Dennis McDonald talk about the, the similarities between Jesus turning water to wine and Dionysus and these festivals and these things, like, okay, he might be wrong on 50% of what he says, fine, but there's still something there. And I just, I, like, I can't make the leap that I, that I see conservatives making that's like, well, it's, but it's true. Like uh, it seems to me, and it, 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 I know we don't have time to get into this. Maybe another another date. But I I keep hearing this over and over again from honest scholars and people that I know, like are honestly seeking the truth. Say to me, "Well, I became a Christian as a you know I grew up as a Christian or became a Christian at a very young age," and I, I and I see it as people going into this. How about even though they might not, they might say, well, I was open minded. I went through a dark valley of shadow of the death and I skeptic and this and that. But I but I still see them say I hear them saying I came into this. Believing so. So that doesn't prove it's wrong. It just says the bias in the beginning is you're when you're in that camp, you're working to show th th this outcome. And then what I what I see is. There's quite a few scholars who came out the other side, you know, Bart Ehrman being the most famous, that said, I could no longer, I could no longer, the cognitive dissonance just got to me. I could no longer accept this is true, but I never he heard, and maybe you know somebody, and if you do, or any of my listeners or any scholars, I would love to interview and talk to somebody who, who went into this as a, you know, not necessarily an atheist, atheist, but at least a skeptic, and said, boy, I went to seminary or Bible college or studied ancient history. And it's so compelling. This, this stuff's so compelling, I became a Christian. I've never heard that story. I've only heard the opposite side. And I've heard it so many times when I start thinking, okay, which is more believable? Well, it, it, seems, like, it seems like there's a genuine heart. Like I, I had a long, I had a li a long live stream with, with uh, somebody you know, uh, Bobby Conway. Of North, you know, he's in North Carolina. So we did a live stream yesterday. that was scheduled for an hour. And we went like two hours. I think we both liked each other. We had a genuine conversation. I think he's a nice person. Obviously, we disagree on the conclusion. But that was one of the things that we kind of talked about is that if, you're, if, you're, if your heart is Jesus is true and he died for my sins and he died for your sins and he loves you, if you go into it, that heart, it, it's, it's a little bit different how you're perceiving the data. Is that, is that and I'm not saying you're wrong, but is that, a, is that a fair? And I'm not saying you're biased. I believe you're honest. and. I believe your scholarship is amazing, but I still say you were you were raised in a Christian family and the expectation, honor your mother and father. So in order to like not honor your, like you're basically breaking the rules of your own religion when you get too critical. You know, Edda, Edda Linnemann was a Boltmannian, a student of uh, Rudolf Boltmann. And so she did not believe, but then she looked at the data and then she became a very conservative Christian. Um, I'm sure there's been some others. Now there's probably gonna be more who go the other way. 
And there's going to be a lot of New Testament scholars who came into it um, and are what they are now. I mean, um, you've got uh, Dale Allison in his book, Resurrecting Jesus, written, I think, in 2005, 2005 or 2006. He says um, that typically New Testament scholars are what they came in as. If they came in as liberal, they're liberal. If they came in as conservative, they're conservative. And then you have a few that, you know, change camps um, after a while. Uh, yeah, Bart Ehrman changed. He, he. Uh, I have no doubt. Uh, I've got my friend um, uh, Jerry Walls, a colleague at Houston Christian University. He's a philosopher. And um, he knew Bart Ehrman when they were both studying at Princeton. They were friends. And he said, Mike, he was really a strong evangelical Christian at that point. So yeah, Bart did look at some things and he fell away and left his Christian faith. But I look at his reasons for doing that. And I don't find his reasons compelling at all. Um, you know, what starts him on it is, uh, you know, he sees a discrepancy about Abiathar uh, in Mark chapter two. Um, and he tried to reconcile it. And his professor said, hey, well, what if Mark got it wrong? OK, well, shortly after that, he gives a biblical inerrancy. You can still be an evangelical or a conservative Christian without believing in inerrancy. Um, and that's not what led him to give up his faith. What led him to give up his faith is the problem of evil, pain, and suffering. Well, he wrote a book on that called God's Problem. And I don't think his arguments in there are very good. And in fact, not even a lot of critics, not even a lot of skeptics gave him a good mark, a good review for that book. So his reason for leaving Christianity and becoming what he terms an agnostic atheist, I think are pretty weak. Um when he says the Gospels are historically unreliable because of the differences in them, and I say to him, we, we talked at a conference in Chicago on a panel discussion back in 2019, and I said, well, Bart, uh, most of these are due to compositional devices where they're, they're paraphrasing, they're changing some things as they were supposed to. He said, I agree, but that makes them historically unreliable. And I said, um, he said, Mike, no one... The average person isn't going to take reliability as you are. And I said, you know, I agree with you, but uh, it's our responsibility as scholars who study these things and who study the philosophy of history and know how history is done to be able to educate it, the in educate the interested lay person on this. Because the interested or because the lay person, the average lay person, is is going to think, well, what about other ancient literature? I said, Bart, all other ancient literature is going to do this the same kind of stuff with the in their biographies. And he said, that's right, they're all unreliable. And I said, well, just think what you're doing there. If you say that all ancient biographies and historical literature is unreliable, you're communicating to the average person that we can know very little about the past. And that is not true. So it's our responsibility as scholars to be able to educate the interested person on these things. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that his arguments for leaving the Christian faith, I, I just don't find them compelling at all. Okay, but that's fair. I, oh, I, let, I, let me I, throw I, in I, one other thing. Oh, sure. Go uh, ahead. Just one other thing real quickly. He talks about the Gospels being anonymous, that we don't have... Uh, their names in the earliest manuscripts. And he is correct on that. We don't have the names of the authors on the earliest manuscripts, so they are uh, formally anonymous. But what Bart doesn't tell you is that all ancient biographies are formally anonymous. Every one except one within that period I mentioned. And that would be Lucian's uh, Passing of Peregrinus. Other than that, they're all formally anonymous in the same sense that the Gospels are. They don't have their name in the uh, in the title. In fact, most of them don't even have the name of the author in the proem. Plutarch's Lives, you don't find his name anywhere throughout there. And if you want to go even further, the, the next one you have is the Life of Elias in the Historia Augusta, written in the final decade of the 4th century. Other than those two, all the ancient biographies are formally anonymous. But the ancients knew who wrote these things, how they knew, we don't know, but they had the sources back then that we no longer have today. A lot of the same things can be said about the gospels, except we do have testimony.
about Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John being the authors. Are those sources unimpeachable? No. But the traditional authorship we have for Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the evidence for it, is superior to what we have for the traditional authorship of Plutarch's lives, which is con Plutarch is considered to be the greatest of all ancient biographers. It, and the the evidence that you're that you're citing in terms of the testimony that those traditional authors are the traditional authors. Correct me if I'm wrong, but th this doesn't happen until the second century, right? Like the church, early church fathers, or is this dated earlier than that? Oh, no, it'd be second century. But remember, the Gospels are probably written between the years 65 and 95. So and the first testimony you have comes from Papias, mm -hmm. you know, could, who could be writing somewhere between the year 100 to 135. So it's not long after the final Gospel was written. Um, okay, fair enough. That, well, this reminds me of another question I want to ask you. In, 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 in some of uh, you're familiar with Jay Warner Wallace's talk on, uh, on his experience, and one of the things he says in his talks is, 99 percent of Christians don't come to Christianity through evidential means, which is something he pushes. He says you should be able to evidentially support your faith, and, and but. So the question I want to ask you is, it seems to me he then uses uh, something that's very not scholarly. So what would you say to Christians that come to the right belief, and in, in, in by right I mean a, a belief that you would agree with, Jesus rises from the dead, Christianity is true, but it's, com but it's based on completely non-scholarly conjecture, like in other words, this idea that a, that a police detective has the, the knowledge to and and I'm, you didn't name the person that was teaching at the school, but I would I would throw his name in the hat too. But this investigative technique is, like I would say, how is that legitimate to say I worked as a as I worked as a detective and I can analyze witness statements and that gives me the credibility to to analyze these statements and say they're eyewitnesses. And in the, and out of the same breath, it's all these PhDs. I don't trust any of them just because they're PhDs. I don't trust them. Scholarship, you guys are the tail wagging the dog. So it's like, wait a minute, he he's, and, and I don't mean he and, and Jay Warner Wallace, but anyone in that camp is is sort of dismissing your scholarship position. Like, hey, it doesn't matter. You have a PhD. I can read this stuff myself. What would you say to a Christian that's built their faith and they believe based, you know, they, in other words, I've heard people say that they were deconstructing, but books like cold case detective helped save their faith. Well, wait a minute, this is not good scholarship. Like if you're going to save your faith, shouldn't you do it from good scholarship and in, and go to someone like say a Michael Kona, as opposed to what seems to me a faulty claim. Like to me, those, those two disciplines have nothing to do with each other. Is, am I wrong in thinking that? Well, I think we have to be careful of, you know, what's called the genetic fallacy. Do we believe something we might believe something for the wrong reason, but that doesn't mean what we believe is is wrong. So if, if people deconstruct their faith after reading Bart Ehrman, I think they're doing so for the wrong reasons, because I think Bart Ehrman's reasons are are weak, and in most cases, easily overturned or answered. Um, maybe a better uh, thing I could, uh, example I would, can give is um, uh, Geza Vermesh's book, uh, he wrote that in the first decade of the 21st century on resurrection. And Geza Vermesh was a Jewish scholar. He was not a Christian. And he provides, he looks at the data, and then he provides six hypotheses. He said, it's probably one of these six that happened. And he says, number one is Jesus rose from the dead. And number six is the inveterate skeptic who says, I'm not going to believe no matter what, and Jesus did not rise from the dead. And then he provides four others. He said, hallucinations, and I don't remember what the other three are. And he said, well, we can dismiss the first one right off because you can only believe resurrection by faith. Well, wait a minute. You, you just want to wave your hand and dismiss it? Um, there are sophisticated accounts out there or, or cases for the resurrection of Jesus. Gary Habermas, William Lane Craig, uh, N.T. Wright. You, you just can't blow those off and say, well, you just have to accept this by faith. No, they present pretty strong historical cases for the resurrection. Um, and you, you need to deal with those things, but he doesn't. 
And then the inveterate skeptic, he says, they're not going to believe no matter what. Well, wait a minute. That doesn't mean they're wrong because they're closed-minded in that sense. Maybe they're right. You, you still have to, you still have to engage with their, their art, their arguments. And then what he does is he just, he rules out those other four and he says, well, I just don't know what happened. Something happened. They had these experiences that led them to believe Jesus rose from the dead, but I don't know what happened. Well, I, I think you, you, you could arrive at that conclusion and be rational, but I don't think the way he got there was, was very good by dismissing the first and sixth. So my point is you could believe it's possible to believe the right thing, but to believe it for the wrong reasons. Now, I, I don't know about the forensic approach like, like Jim Wallace does. I like Jim. He's, he's a neat guy. He's a man of great integrity. I, he and I don't see eye to eye on this in terms of why there are differences in the Gospels. He might be right in some cases, like I think he probably is when it comes to things like Jesus' trial before Pilate. Um, but in most of the cases, especially when you have this kind of verbatim agreement, I mean, it's pretty obvious when there's a verbatim agreement, obvious to me at least, that, um, you know, they're using a common source here and that any changes are due intentionally. So would it be fair to say if somebody said, I was struggling with my faith, I read J. Warner Wallace and I believe it's all verbatim eyewitness testimony, so I, so I, you know, I saved my faith. Would it be fair, would it be fair of me as a critic to say, wait a minute, the, the scholarship here doesn't back up what he's saying, doesn't mean he's wrong, but you need to go read Mike Lacona's book, and maybe we can close with that. Go read Mike's book, because if you're going to believe in Christianity, it seems like you need to stick to solid, good scholarship. People that have degrees, I mean, it doesn't just because you have a PhD doesn't make you right, but at least if you're looking at N.T. Wright and, and Gary Habermas, People who have dedicated their their lives to studying these things, and you and yourself, who have historical training and can understand Greek, that that at least then I can't like I, I I could say well okay you have a good foundation, and this isn't to dismiss Jay Warner Wallace, but I think it's not fair to say here's a here's a detective who says Jesus is the Gospels are true because I read them as as witness statements using forensic statement analysis which is, which is no. No, no historical departments teaching this. Is that fair? And of course, it's it's also a pitch for your book. So let's close with that and go ahead and pitch your book again. Well, answer my question if you don't mind, but then go ahead and, and pitch your book and give us a, I know people will, will be watching this in the future, so your book will be have been released. But for people watching this when it first comes out, when's your book coming out? And give us a little pitch on why they should um, why they should be interested in reading your perspective. I think when now the majority of scholars can be mistaken, but I, I think a lot a lot of the times the majority of scholars are going to be correct, especially especially if uh, you have a heterogeneous consensus of scholars who have studied who specialized in a topic. So, you know, if someone said to, to me as a New Testament scholar, "What do you think about archaeology in in the Old Testament?" Well my opinion on that is worthless. It's worth zero because it's not something I've studied. Um, if you asked Mike Lacona, do you, you know, when, when do you think Mark was written? Well, I've studied it a little bit, but I'd, I'd probably say, well, this is what the majority of scholars say. Well, what do you think, Mike? Well, I don't, I really don't have too much of an educated opinion because I haven't looked at it in great detail. And so I'm not weighing in as an expert. So when we look at what scholars in the relevant field who can weigh in as an expert on that topic, and when you have a heterogeneous consensus on that, so you know people from all different backgrounds on that can agree on it, then I think that that's got to be pretty strong. Um, and I would weigh, give that more weight than I would someone speaking on the issue who is outside of the discipline. Now, that said, I do think that people outside the discipline can, on occasion, they can offer some, some good things that those of us in the discipline uh, might benefit from. But I, I think it, if more in more cases than not, you're going to find that those outside the discipline probably aren't going to 
give a better explanation than those who are trained experts in the discipline. So now finally, uh, the new book that is coming out, um, Jesus Contradicted, is more of a popular level version of my monograph that was published by uh, Oxford University Press back in 2017. And um, so I break down things more, uh, get into more detail with things. I give some new examples. Um, um, I give some updates that I didn't have in the other one, things that I've learned since to maybe nuance my things a little better than I did then. And then some of the questions that I've been asked over the years, how does this all square with the belief of Christians that the Bible is divinely inspired and the belief of, of a number of evangelical Christians, especially in the U.S., that the Bible is without any errors whatsoever. And so I devote two chapters to that. And this book is, is um, so this book is a lot friendlier of a read. It is also geared in such a way that it can be used in small group discussions. Um, in fact, I did some of these discussions with the um, uh, morning Bible study of the Atlanta Braves front office. This isn't something that was sanctioned by the Atlanta Braves, so I want to be clear about that. Um, but it involved a lot of their executives and marketing team, and I did a 12-week session with them. I did it at another church, a large church here in the Atlanta area. And so I ran them through these, uh, these as a group thing and was able to you know, get some of the bugs out, and um, they just loved it. They ate the stuff up. And um, so this is a lot friendlier read. It's a more engaging read. Hopefully it's not dry. I don't think it's dry. And um, yeah, so I'm excited about this book. And Zondervan has just been a dream to work with, the publisher. Well, that sounds amazing. I look forward to reading it myself. Um, I appreciate your time and I really enjoy our, our discussions. I look forward to maybe having some more in the future. I will say goodbye to you for today. And um, I look forward to reading your book and I can encourage everybody else out in my audience to um, be open to different different versions of, of scholarship and different stuff and go get Mike's book. All right, Mike. <laughs> All right, audience. <laughs> I will see you later. Bye bye. Thanks. Thanks for watching. And please like and subscribe. I'm still a small channel and I'm, of course, trying to trying to build myself up. All right. Goodbye, everybody. <laughs>